welcome to Somerville Livewire. I'm Mary Ellen Year. About a year and three months ago, um, we started a pandemic. There was a, a state of emergency declared. Um, people were potentially losing jobs. People were potentially going to be evicted from, because they weren't able to make their payments on their rents. Nobody knew how dangerous the pandemic was going to be. So what to do? So imagine that you are someone whose hours were cut, but you weren't actually unemployed. So you weren't getting any of the funds um, that other people were able to apply for. Imagine that you're a landlord, you own your property, but you depend on that income to pay your bills. Maybe you've lived there for a long time, maybe you inherited it, so you don't have a mortgage, but this is income that you need. What to do? Imagine then it, that you're a roommate and it's going very badly, or you are living with a partner and you've got some domestic violence concerns, but here we are in the middle of a pandemic. We don't want the disease to spread. We don't want people to be homeless, um, what to do. So to address all of these issues, um, the governor, the country, and the city of Somerville issued an eviction moratorium. So what impact did that have on both renters and on landlords? To talk about these issues, we're joined by Ellen Schockner. Schachter and Steve Remus. Ellen currently serves as the director of the city of Somerville's Office of Housing Stability. Um, Ellen, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. And Steve Remus owns a real estate office. He's been doing this for 40 years. He's the chairman of the Somerville Property Owners Coalition, and he's also a property owner. Steve, thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure. Thank you. So, Ellen, Please tell us about the state of renters. What, what were the provisions of the eviction moratorium in Somerville? How did that affect what renters could or could not do? Yeah, thanks. This is such an important topic. And I just wanted to um, let people know there's kind of three layers of moratorium that's out there without making it too complicated. There was a state moratorium, which ended a little while ago. There is a federal moratorium that is still in place until the end of June, until the end of this month. And then Somerville had a moratorium, which was a little different than the others. The Somerville moratorium did two basic things. One, it didn't prevent any owner from beginning an eviction process, but it says nobody could be physically removed from their unit because of the risks of that dislocation of becoming physically homeless and COVID. Um, the second thing it did was to limit entry by um, realtors prospective owners to tenants, uh, to tenants premises during the course of the moratorium, again, in order to prevent the spread of illness. Um, as the, the emergency moratorium statewide as the emergency declaration ends on June 15th. There are gonna be upcoming changes to our local moratorium as well. Um, but I wanted to give you that brief background and then to say these moratoriums were absolutely critical to maintaining the health and safety of our vulnerable populations in the city. I am really, really proud to say that nobody was physically removed forcibly from their homes during the time of this moratorium and also that people were protected from having the risk of COVID in their homes by people entering. Um, and I do just wanna last say that um, there were both a, a lot of win-win situations coming from this moratorium. We have helped tenants to secure about $1.5 million, which has gone to landlords and rental assistance. So this moratorium gave us the time we needed to work effectively with the thousands of tenants that were coming to us for assistance and have the time to get rental applications processed to make sure people had some place to stay and really to help landlords a lot with the collection of their rent during this time that they otherwise would not simply not have been able to get. And last, and I'll, then I'll turn this over. I did just wanna say that our office also helped small landlords and homeowners who needed help with their mortgages. So we were really trying to do what we can to see this from both sides and to do whatever we could to create win-win situations. We didn't. We do not want to see landlords that become unstable because of a lack of, of rental payments as well. So we hope that this created a good climate both for landlords and for tenants in the city. Um, and we know that it went a long way towards limiting the impact 
um, on renters in the city. Last three weeks, there have been zero evictions filed. That is just a huge attest attestation to the cooperation now between landlords and tenants in the community and people knowing how to access our services. Well, that sounds like a big win for everyone. Now, the funds that you had, so obviously there was a moratorium, so you couldn't, so landlords couldn't ask people to leave for whatever reason. I mean, I think it's important for people to say that is that, yeah. you know, even if you were living with a roommate and your roommate, you felt was behaving, um, you know, in a dangerous way that you were at risk from that roommate, you legally could not even talk to them about perhaps leaving because you felt uncomfortable with their practices. That's that's not, not accurate. Certainly there are issues. People could go for restraining orders under domestic violence orders. There's other provisions that might have to do if there's violence or danger in the home. And I would also just say that the state moratorium did have a clause that allowed for health and safety um, evictions. So each moratorium is a little bit different and the federal one only applied to non-payment cases. Um, so, yeah, my yeah. understanding is the state one, the, if you, if you had, a, if you were in a roommate situation that you were the one that had to leave, not the roommate, but you know, that's, um, you're, you're saying no. Okay. Well, I can't yeah. go find it. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, it totally depends, um, on, the circumstance. It totally depends yeah, yeah. on the circumstances. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, um, so Steve, tell us a little bit from your experience. I mean, you bought, you know, you're, um, um, head of the, um, small property owners, this, um, coalition. Um, what are the things that you heard during this process? First of all, what did the, how did the law affect landlords, um, in terms of what they could, the conversations they could have and so forth with, uh, their as, far as, as far as evictions, um, I agree with Ellen. We really didn't see a lot, uh, regarding that, uh, as far as, um, I would say non-payment of rent. I really did not see that for the most part either. I, I, I thought uh, that was minimal. The biggest effect was adjustments to rent, which has basically nothing to do with kind of what you're talking about, but that was the impact on the landlords was mm -hmm. empty apartments, mm -hmm. renewals, where mm -hmm. they would not, tenants would not pay market rent. Um, mm -hmm. And again, you were into the, supply and demand and market, right? So right. the issue was Tufts, Harvard, MIT, thousands upon thousands of students that were not coming back. And more the effect was all those empty apartments. And then you had the regular vacancies. Now you have a flood of available rents, I mean, of available apartments. Therefore, the rents started dropping. Yeah. Uh, and the landlords were, you know, they had to do incentives, they were offering, you know, free months of rent, etc. They had to get someone creative. But again, that's a market condition due to the effects of COVID, uh, if we can put it that way. Uh, as a percentage uh, from the people that I've talked to, uh, rents typically dropped up to up to and around 30%, which is significant. I mean, right. that, that was huge. So from our perspective, you know, I mean, this. <laughs> A, a lot of people screaming for rent control and here we're dealing with a market where uh, apartments are plentiful and rents have dropped significantly. Um, and that's one of the things the Somerville Property Owners Coalition is trying to obviously uh, fight as well. But market conditions have tended to, you know, uh, equal or, or cause equality, if you will, um, if not a detriment to the landlords. So. You know, yeah. the, the, I would say the effects were not from an eviction moratorium. The effects were from the market conditions. Um, where I did hear, ironically, is outside of this area um, where the eviction moratorium caused severe hardship. Um, and I'm wondering if it's because, you know, for lack of a, a better term, pe maybe people weren't as well educated in those areas per se. Um, but what I heard was tenants who could pay the rent that stopped paying the rent and they were doing it in numbers, knowing that nothing could stop them from being evicted. At least this is the thought and this is what I heard. But none of that I experienced locally. Uh, locally, I, I, I did not hear it. But outside of this area, um, there was definitely problems and issues. 
So that's really interesting that, you know, maybe we just have um, a better cadre of people here. I mean, we all think Somerville is great. So that's <laughs> actually really, really great news. I, I think yeah, I think you can all agree. I'm pretty impressed with the, the knowledge and education of the people in our city. Uh, um, and I, yeah. uh, uh, without question. Uh, and and I, I, we also just here locally have the breadth of service providers, my office, but not only my office, you know, we're one of two offices of housing stability in the state. The city has committed significant resources to our office, but we have other agencies, a really strong network of providers coming together to make sure no tenants fall through the cracks. And our mayor committed a significant amount of money to rental assistance. And I think Steve would have seen more in Somerville because we went from having about 200 anticipating about 275 requests for service in our first year. In our first 10 months of this fiscal year, we had 1,300 families coming to us for assistance. So the desperation was there. Right, but right. fortunately, we had a lot of the pieces in put play. And I did want to say, though, that this is really at risk right now today. There was a vote on something pending in the State House that is absolutely critical to keeping our Somerville families in their homes. And that is there was a provision in the law that said that as long as a tenant had applied for rental assistance, they, they couldn't be a victim because of a delay in processing because many of the rental programs now I have one you know in metro housing they work really hard but because of the demand it can take a month before I get a case manager assigned from their end so that protection is about to go away on June 15th and this morning the state senate is voting as to see whether or not on an emergency basis that provision and the provision that required that tenants be notified along with notices to quit of available legal services and rental assistance programs. And those key pieces are so critical and are set to expire on June 15th if they're not passed by the state house as this an emergency order. So I think we are at a very, very important precipice right now in terms of tenants' ability to prevent evictions due to the loss of income related from COVID. Well, to that point, I mean, some of the things that I had heard about is that the housing court is so backed up that it was just literally taking, you know, or the whole process of people getting the funds. I mean, it's not just yeah. the application process and so forth. How do you think that's working at this point? So that's what I would say. There was a period where um, what happened was when the federal government expanded benefits, just the number of rental assistance benefits that are being processed by the state through regionals in our area, it's Metro Housing Boston, because there's more help available right now, significantly more help than there has ever been before, the number of applications are skyrocketing. So it is a slow process, which is why we need to make sure that the protections are in place so that nobody gets evicted because they're waiting for somebody to process their application. The vast majority of evictions are for non-payment of rent. Sometimes somebody's selling a building, sometimes there's a cause violation of a lease, but the vast majority are non-payment cases. So we just need to make sure that getting through that process means people won't get evicted. And that's that's what we really need to make sure on the state level, on the local level, right? This is, this is I think, the urgency right now because um, we, the, you know, the agencies just can't keep up. They hire, they hire, they lose people, they need language access. It's been just a constant churning. And as the applications continue to increase as people become aware of the availability. Now, again, some people have gone back to work. Some people are stabilized. So I uh, thank goodness. And we have a lot of clients ourselves that are back on track, paying their rent stabilized, but not everybody has returned at all to their pre-pandemic wages, particularly in the hotel and restaurant industries. So I do think the courts, while the courts are backed up, that is true. It really, really depends. Summary process still is relatively quick. Most cases get settled. The vast majority of summary process cases, over 90% get settled. I do just want to note, though, that in the state's dash, eviction dashboard, over 93% of tenants were unrepresented and only about 20% of landlords were unrepresented. There's a huge imbalance of power. So our job is to do what we can to keep things out of the courts. We do not want that imbalance of power and that vulnerability to play a role in whether a tenant agrees to move out when they really, really don't need to or other things. So I think that's 
Yeah. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to come back to that because I think that, you know, the whole representation thing is, mm -hmm. you know, another layer. And so, mm -hmm. so far we've mentioned um, um, rent control. Now we're talking about representation. I mean, we could probably do about five more episodes <laughs> um, to cover all of these issues. Yeah. But one of the things I feel like in Somerville, Somerville has a super high percentage of the population that are renters, right? More than many, many other areas. Yes. What is it? It's over 50% two or thirds. two thirds. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um, what I'm wondering is, and, and people kind of know that, and we can talk about those demographics, but Steve, I was wondering, can you tell us the demographics of the landlords, you know, because we hear, you know, in, in all of these conversations, you know, and it's going to come up in the political campaigns and so forth, which is, you know, development, there are concerns about the cost of housing, um, and that, you know, quite frankly, landlords have a bad reputation, you know, in a lot of um, sectors within the, the city. So tell us about the landlords. Who are the landlords in okay, Somerville? The landlords that I met that have a bad reputation are the, very much in the minority. Um, I'm going to tell you that most of the only, a lot of the landlords I deal with, most of them, uh, mm -hmm. will time some of the property owners, and those are the people that are getting hit the worst. So specifically, yeah, I just went and saw an apartment, to, you know, a unit today. You know, um, the house on the outside is, you know, moderate. Uh, inside is decent, but he's lived there for 40 years. He's renting out his apartment. Um, and it's those people that have been around some of them 20, 30, 40 years or more, believe it or not, that are charging the most reasonable rent. And the, unfortunately, those are the people that are under attack. Uh, very much so, as far as from transfer taxes to, you know, c controlling the rents, and it really doesn't apply to these people, to condo con the condo conversion law, which is a huge thing as far as we're concerned. Um, the, this, the restrictions are beyond reasonable. It was bad before. It is literally put a stop to condo conversion in some of them. So if I'm a small yeah. property owner and I want to convert my property, you know, obviously it's going to affect my value. But as far as demographics, um, I, it's really all over the place. You have the people that have been here for a very long time um, because of the prices. And uh, I'd say a lot of the numbers don't make a lot of sense from a rental perspective. Um, recently, with how strict the condo ordinance has been, developers aren't buying and, in fact, fleeing uh, from doing anything in some of them. But you have more of a contingent of people that want to live in the properties. Um, and that's probably a, a new and welcome part of uh, some of the homeowners maybe, maybe coming in uh, as well. So it, it's really all over the place. With the green line, I'm gonna tell you just as far as houses that we have up for sale, we're seeing put more people in the medical community, uh, believe it or not, that are, that are coming to take a look at these houses for sale. And you have to realize obviously with the, you know, not over 93% of some of them or better will be walking distance to a T, that's attracting professionals that want access to Boston. So that's really opening some of them up quite a bit to so many people that can now take transportation to so many different areas. So it's really, it's really all over the place. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's no question that um, the cost of housing continues to go up, except for a 30% decline during a pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> for, so, so there is that. It's um, in demand. I mean, uh, I mean, yeah. it, it, yeah. it can be that simple. Um, Somerville's a great place. That's I, the, that's the thing. So go ahead, Ellen. Just gonna say a couple of things. One is unfortunately, from my perspective, that 30% has rebounded very quickly and the vacancy rates have gone significantly down. For a little while during the pandemic, we were actually able to find housing for people with Section 8 vouchers, for people who are middle income. That started to disappear again now that the schools are gonna reopen and everything. So things are going back to where they were before. But yeah. I really just did wanna say, you know, I, I hear the concerns about some restrictions on the freedom of property owners. I hear that, you know, yes, I helped to draft that condo ordinance that's in place and I'm really proud of it. And I'm really proud that less people are being displaced now than were before. And I did just want to say, we have an absolute crisis in our city. We have a crisis in our city. We have a crisis in the region and frankly, nationally and internationally as out of state investors come in. In Somerville, the last data I saw had about and I, I will tell you, this is approximate, like I can't remember exactly, something like two thirds, 100% cash sales, 100% cash sales. Think about what that means. Think about how much money the people who are buying property in the city of Somerville have when they're doing, when they're bidding out other people. 
for cash sales. So, you know, the amount of profit that has been made is, is, is really large. Regardless, we are not trying to prevent people from having profit, but we're saying it has to be reasonable because housing ultimately has to be a fundamental human right. We just talked about tent cities out in Austin. Where are people going to go? In the city of Somerville, this is a top number one priority because it is simply inhumane to say that people except for the very wealthy can live in Somerville. I don't think that's the Somerville any well, of us want. I'm gonna say very simply, there is a middle ground. And there are things that have been done to the extreme that are no middle ground. The condo conversions went from 234 to 10. It was literally stopped. The, the, what you love about Somerville is being destroyed as well. What you love about Somerville, a lot of the developers created, the stores they brought in, the properties they fixed up. I've seen properties that were up for sale for very cheap money that were a blight on the neighborhood that the bottom line, no one would take. Stuff that wasn't multiple bids, stuff that didn't sell cash, stuff that was up for sale for 45 to 60 days and no regular homeowner, if you were a regular buyer, would take Well, we would on. love to know about those properties, Steve, because we are we have a number of sources of funds. We have something called the 100 Homes Program, which really looks to buy up properties to be able to keep them as affordable housing. And if there are properties that you think are below market because they're distressed, I would really urge you to I'm let not, me know. No, I'm not going to say they're great well, well, if, I could, if I could just jump in here, okay. I mean, you know, I think we can all agree that people need to be housed. I think yeah. the disagreement is about how you achieve that goal. And, you know, so, so, you know, you've got the condo conversion thing, you know, what about, you know, and, and, and again, I'd love to do another show where we talk about what are various models for achieving those goals, because honestly, mm -hmm. the cost of housing is so high in Somerville right now. It's, I swear to God, it's like monopoly money, mm -hmm. you know, where people offer 75,000 more than, you know, than, than asking. And it's, you know, less than 5%, uh, you know, change right. in the, I, I mean, it's, I would it's say crazy. as far as displacing the tenants, at least for properties that anything that we have sold, nobody that I've been dealing with for the past 20 years buys properties with tenants in them to convert. That's the problem, people. Steve. That is the big problem. That is the problem. As buildings become sold, they get emptied out. And once they're turned over and the prices have escalated by millions of dollars, it's not feasible for that new owner to continue to rent at reasonable rents to those tenants. Well, we would love to see those buildings before people are displaced and emptied out come into our portfolio to be stabilized so that the people selling them can get a fair market return, but that we can use those properties to keep people in place rather than emptying buildings for profit on turnover. Okay, but there are situations where I, I can have owned a house, it's all family, family mm -hmm. owned, it's never mm -hmm. been rented out, and you're still stopping me from doing anything that I want regarding condo conversion or sale of the property. Oh, that's simply not true. There's a delay period. Oh, There's no, a it's for, for a year. Who's going to carry right. the property for a year? So, you know, I mean, this is a whole other issue we could talk about, but if from my I think we should do it. Right, we'll do it another time. <laughs> I'm just going to say, we all only right. have just a few minutes <laughs> left. Yeah, that's what's so, so, right. yeah we, definitely, right. we definitely need to talk about that because that's a huge issue because there are a yeah. lot of different models for subsidizing housing, like getting those people into the housing market in a different way than, you know, that, I mean, why did we pick the condo conversion approach, you know, Ellen, that you wrote, um, you know, there are other models in other countries that people are doing, um, you know, what, you know, what are, what are the, what are the approaches that are possible? Honestly, Mary Ellen, we are looking for every tool that is at all feasible for us to do to prevent the kind of dislocation and, and, and displacement that we're experiencing in the city. So, so we are doing a multifaceted approach, but you know, the way our government works in Massachusetts is a little different than other places. We need state approval to do almost anything to regulate um, landlord tenant law. So we are handicapped in a way that many cities are not around the country and around the world where they have their own ability to set their own policies to determine what that right balance is, right? Between profit made in the real estate industry and the protection of tenants. So we do yeah. what we are able to do locally and we do what we can do at the state house, but we are not trying to rely on one thing. We are very open. We are very open. It is our end goal to prevent displacement that is critical to us, not the yeah. way that it happens. Yeah, Steve, what were you gonna say? So where, yeah, where does some of them rank as far as affordable housing in Boston and what are your goals? 
what do you mean by when you say at where does it rank in affordable so housing? I, so I've heard that twenty percent is affordable, and you're obviously trying oh. to create more affordable housing. So over the so overall not some of a rank with our, uh, surrounding communities. Be, let, let's say Cambridge or Boston. So we are well behind <laughs> Cambridge. Cambridge has a much higher uh, percentage of affordable housing, frankly, because they have the money to subsidize it, right? So they have a lot right. more money in their coffers than Somerville does. Our goal, I believe, the summer vision plan calls for overall 20% of units to be affordable to people at up to working income levels. And, and so we are not anywhere yeah. near there. Hmm? So sorry. we have we have one minute left. So I just want to say, so what's what's your final thought that you want people to leave with, Steve, in less than 30 seconds? <laughs> listen, uh, we are, listen, I, I have four kids. I'm sensitive to the plight of tenants. No one's trying to evict anybody, especially during a time of hardship. Um, I think from our perspective, we just want input. Um, we're not the big bad landlords that we're supposedly portrayed as, and there's a beating heart underneath the tough skin, if you want to put it that way. Um, all we want is input um, into what's going on. Uh, and if it there's an effect on landlords that you've overlooked. Um, I think we just want to see that addressed. Okay, Ellen, what are your final thoughts? Yeah, I, 20 guess seconds. I, just, I guess my last 30 seconds, I just really, really want to say that ultimately somebody that housing is so fundamental to people's mental health, physical health, ability to get jobs, kids to remain in schools. And so it has to be, you know, our, our country takes for granted now that children have a right to access to public education. That would have been thought of as, as a socialist idea way back when. We need to recognize that food, housing, medical care, that these are things that every person in our society needs. So we need to have remedies, we need to have strategies, and we need to pull together as a community to do everything we can with the landlords, with the homeowners, with the government, to make sure that everybody in this country has the basic, basic, basic things that they need to survive. Thank you, Ellen. Um, so it's, uh, I mean, my biggest takeaway from this is that the eviction moratorium, for the most part, worked in Somerville. Both of you kind of said that, that, that for the most part, that seemed to, to work. So we don't have any more time. So I just want to thank both of you for sharing your knowledge. Obviously, there's a lot more to talk about. And we'll be back in two weeks for the next edition of Somerville Livewire. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you.